uh, let me introduce you what I mean by kind of brass camp lib inequality. You know, actually there are two brass camp lib inequalities in, in this area. So that one is about the variant and so on, which is kind of a very, Variation of the breakable under inequality, but uh, now I am going to talk about another Bras Kamplieb inequality, where kind of the Bras Kamplieb data is uh, that we have some surjective linear maps from Rn into, into various uh, Euclidean uh, spaces of naturally uh, smaller dimension or, or the same dimension. And uh, we have this condition on the dimension of the of this R and R and I that uh, um, a linear combination with some positive uh, coefficients of these Ni's is, is this N. So that kind of the breast camp data is a set of these surjective linear maps and these coefficients, but the, uh, we have this condition when we also have the condition that the um, intersection of the kernels should be trivial. So this is kind of the breast camp data. It's kind of a frame condition for those who Use those um, well, familiar with uh, those, and and then uh, we use some L1, non-negative L1 functions on on these R to the n minus i, and uh, the brass complete inequality that I'm talking about is is the following. It's, it's kind of a generalization of Herder. So uh, it, on R n. Uh, for each x, you, you take this uh, linear map bi and you evaluate it at this function fi that was defined on r to the ni, and you raise it to the power ci and you take the product of all, all of these expressions. And this integral is bounded above by certain constant times the integral of the fi's to the power uh, ci. And the point is so that. Um, but the constant is so naturally this is the real question. So the point is that this constant can be evaluated uh, if you only consider centered Gaussian. <clears throat> so so this is the original Bros complete inequality. The first in the first version it was kind of the rank one case when uh, all of these is ni's um, were just one. So this was proved in uh, in 1976 and uh, somewhat later Lieb extended to uh, the inequality to this uh, full generality. And uh, by centered Gaussian, I, I, I mean this type of expressions. So this is the inequality, and this constant C is kind of mysterious, but the point is that uh, uh, you, if uh, some constant works for all uh, centered Gaussians, then it, it works for, for all uh, Evan functions, non negative Evan functions. And uh, as I said, that uh, when all of these dimensions are, are just n, and say B, these bi's are just um, identity maps, then we just get back the Herder inequality, and the, this constant c is, is gone. So uh, this uh, brass complete inequality, uh, so it, it's coming from harmonic analysis, but um, it has been used in analytic number theory, in signal processing, in, in just various um, parts of mathematics. Um, it came into the attention of the, came to the attention of uh, complexity people by the work of Keys Ball, but uh, yeah, I, I will tell you a little bit uh, about that a, a little bit later. And the point is that um, um, Frank Barth uh, proved that uh, there is kind of a reverse form of the Bros complete inequality, um, where we take uh, for each x we don't simply take this product, but but what we do that. For each x, we represent the x as the linear combination of uh, this um, ci, and uh, this is the adjoint uh, times xi for any xi in r to the n i, and take the similar type of products. And, uh, and then uh, we have a uh, kind of the reverse inequality, and again, the optimal constant is uh, it can be calculated if you only consider. Uh, um, just the uh, centered uh, Gaussians. So this is the inequality. And we observe that if uh, all of these dimensions are n, then we get the pre copolider inequality. In this case, the uh, capital D is one. So it's a very useful inequality. 
uh, the point is that somehow you have to calculate the constant. And it was the observation of, of this board that one can do it, but before going that, uh, uh, so I can do it in a kind of a geometric situation, but before going to that, uh, um, let me have just some remarks about, first of all, about the methods of proofs. So the original proof of uh, Broskamp and Bleib, so for, the, for this Broskamp Bleib inequality, it was by kind of symmetrization. And it was Frank Barth who observed that uh, uh, this inequality, it just fits uh, perfectly into the theory of optimal transportation uh, as initiated by kind of Benier. So this new, new point of view and then Kaffarelli uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, <coughs> and uh, did uh, some uh, very important work on that. Actually, uh, as far as I know, um, this uh, reverse inequality by Frank Barth was the first case when the optimal, the theory of optimal transportation led to a new, um, new inequality. It's also has, has some historic importance. But pretty soon after uh, Frank Barth's proof, uh, uh, Karl and Lieb and Loss observed that the uh, kind of the heat equation can be, that there are heat equation proofs, and it turns out that the, this method works both for uh, the block complete and the reverse block complete inequality. And uh, kind of the final work was done by Frank Barth and uh, by Huet in, in a paper uh, somewhat later, where they, they showed the, uh, the, that both uh, inequality can be proved using heat equation methods. And uh, about the same time, Joseph uh, Loeck uh, also proved both inequalities using probabilistic argument. Now, my, my main interest um, in this talk is uh, uh, considering extremizers. Now, uh, kind of the theory uh, which led to understanding when actual, when you might expect extremizers was uh, developed by this landmark paper by Bennett, Carberry, Christian, Terence Tau, so that we do have a connection to UCLA, yes, even if I cannot be there. So that uh, there are extremizers uh, for these inequalities, if and only if, if there are Gaussian extremizers. So otherwise, these constants um, in the inequality, this C and D, they are just kind of limits. But <clears throat> you have witnesses, if and only if you have Gaussian extremizers, and um, also, uh, they proved that uh, uh, we have examizers in, if in a natural sense uh, or breast camp leap data, so these uh, surjective linear combinations, surjective linear uh, transformation and so on, um, it's equivalent to so called geometric breast camp leap da data. What does it mean? So, uh, here it's uh, better to write this uh, as. Instead of considering R to the ni, you consider subspaces of R to the n. And uh, the surjective uh, linear transformations are just simply replaced by the orthogonal projections into these subspaces. So this orthogonal pr uh, projection into PI, they, they had the role of, of the BI. And, and then um, the condition is that the Using the CIs, the linear combination of these orthogonal transformations should be the identity map of, of R to the N. Now, here, if you, you, you just equate the trace of the left hand side and the right hand side, you do get that uh, C, the sum of the CI and I's is N. So you do get this condition that was uh, in, in, for the original data in order to inequality make sense. So here it, it's building into this formula. So this is. A very elegant formula. This ball observed this representation uh, when actually, I think, as a PhD student. So that I think it's an encouraging sign for a many PhD student that, uh, I don't know, in many cases, uh, this is kind of the most innovative time of, of your life. So you really have to use it uh, well. <clears throat> and uh, he, he was using it to prove. Um, the op optimal uh, volume ratio and, and so on. So if, if I have this condition, then the, the breast complete inequality, we have this uh, very nice form. So we do have the constant, it is just one. So that if I, if I have some um, L, no negative L1 functions fi on, on the subspace ei, 
And uh, for any X in Rn, I evaluate Fi at the projection of X into Ai and then raise uh, the value at the power Ci and take the product take the integral. And it is at most uh, the integral of the product of the integrals of the functions to the power Ci. So again, we get that the herder naturally. And then um, um, Frank Bart's um, reverse geometric in, uh, inverse complete inequality um, has, has this form that uh, uh, instead of these uh, projection of this fixed X into each of the EIs, but you do that uh, we represent X as a linear combination with this, the coefficients are the CIs that were given and the linear combinations of uh, Yi, uh, this should be a Yi, uh, uh, this should, uh, I'm sorry, this should be an Xi. So you take an Xi from EI, uh, I'm sorry, it's a typo, and then uh, uh, evaluate Fi at, at this Xi. And then you take uh, these products. If it, uh, the condition, uh, what we had originally tells us that uh, if Xi is just the projection of, of X, then this would work, this formula would work. So in the first complete inequality, we have one possible choice, but if we optimize above all possible exercise, then we do get an upper bound for the very same expression that was on the right-hand side of the geometric gross complete inequality. So this is Bart's uh, reverse gross complete inequality in the geometric setting. And again, we do get the um, of under. What's very nice about um, uh, the geometric brass complete inequality that uh, we do get very nice uh, uh, XML functions. So that one possible choice is that so you can also choose the standard uh, Gaussian on each EI, but uh, I just use this formula because it's shorter to write it down. So that because then you just use the very same formula for each EI. So formally saying that uh, e to the minus pi times uh, x, x norm square, Euclidean norm square. So the, this is the, <clears throat> on each EI, just consider this uh, Gaussian probability density. So, um, so this is this geometric form uh, that seems to be the kind of the right setup if you want to understand the extremizers. So um, kind of this structure theory of Bennett, Darbury, Christ, uh, Christian and Tao, uh, was and which was kind of the breakthrough for XML that they observed that we should consider these critical subspaces. So in the, I, I tell you the theory only in, in the geometric setting. So that uh, a critical subspace is a space where somehow the brass company or the reverse brass company inequality splits into the kind of critical subspace and the orthogonal and its ort orthogonal complement. So that we, we do have the right uh, uh, homogeneity condition, or in other words, a subspace is a critical subspace. If uh, uh, any any of these uh, uh, EIs can be written as the uh, intersection of EI and V and the uh, and the orthogonal complement. So the orthogonal com complement within EI is the intersection of the orthogonal complement uh, in the in the big space. So for critical subspaces, um, uh, the orthogonal complement is naturally an, um, kind of by definition is a critical subspace, their sum and their intersection is also a critical subspace. So that we have a very nice structure. And then, so this, this led to the, the understanding the extremas. Now, um, but uh, Waldemarsson, uh, Somewhat later, observed that if you really want to understand uh, extremizers, then uh, you have to consider these so called independent and dependent subspaces. Um, so, uh, a subspace is uh, called independent. If it, so, you have these EIs, and what you do is that you take for each index, you take either EI or its orthogonal complement. So you make a choice. And for this type of intersection, whatever you get, this is kind of an independent subspace, um, but it's only interesting if it is non-trivial. So you kind of make a lot, make a note, take a bookkeeping. So for all these type of intersections, you kind of list all those uh, that are non-trivial. It may happen that you don't, don't find any such subspace. And the dependent subspace, is the 
um, orthogonal complement of the sum of these independent subspaces. These independent subspaces are, are orthogonal to each other. So this is just by definition. So, so you, you do get a um, direct sum decomposition of, of Rn this way into the one dependent subspace and the direct sum of the uh, in, independent subspaces. So it's possible that the, say if you have kind of uh, these EIs are random subspaces, then you only have dependent subspace. And in this case, just uh, to have some notation, I would say that L is one and F one is the trivial subspace, just, just for the next formula. But yeah, because uh, uh, these uh, critical subspaces uh, um, have uh, some very nice properties, and 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 this way, I, I don't have to always say whether we have independent subspace or um, or uh, or dependent subspace and so on. So here I just um, repeated what I have already said. This this is the condition for the this is for the breast complete data. This is kind of the con uh, this property of independent and dependent subspaces. So first of all, it's easy to see that both dependent and independent subspaces are critical subspaces. And it comes just from definition that if I have an independent subspace, then it for any EI, it is either a subset of EI or it's orthogonal to EI. And also I want to know that for dependent subspace, it's a critical subspace, so that it means that restricting kind of the cross complete data to the dependent subspace, we, we get a kind of a, a new kind of smaller uh, breast complete data. And we have this uh, in, uh, property, the dependence of F is expressed by the property that uh, if I take the union of EI and the orthogonal complement, and then uh, take the intersection of all of these uh, unions, and then it, it would be just trivial. So this expresses the fact that uh, uh, this uh, F, F is a dependent subspace. And the, the big theorem of Vardy Marson is that uh, any extremizer of the geometric best complete data can be written in the following form. So for the independent subspaces, you just choose any functions that you want. So that's why it's called independent subspace. So you choose any uh, non-negative error functions that you want. And for the dependent subspace, you choose a uh, um, Gaussian. So that, that is encoded by this positive definite matrix A. So that any, any function is written as kind of the, the part on the Gaussian, uh, the Gaussian on, for the dependent subspace and for each independent subspace that is contained in EI, you know, or FI is defined on EI. So for each independent subspace that is uh, contained in EI, you just take the, um, your, your chosen favorite function, H, Hj, that was, and you take the, the product. So, uh, any XMAs are really split around the independent subspaces and the dependent subspace. And for independent subspaces, you can choose your favorite function. And for the dependent subspace, the XMAR has to be a, a Gaussian, a center. Uh, actually, <clears throat> it uh, doesn't even have to be centered, so you can, you can have some, some shifts. Now, the, the main uh, result. Uh, is that for the reverse bus complete inequality, uh, we can also have a similar decomposition. And here, maybe I just uh, point out the, the differences. Um, remember the reverse bus, uh, bus complete inequality was related to the pre and we know that for pre the extrema functions are, are log concave. And it is the same for the reverse bus complete inequality, so that these HEAs, they have to be log concave, and um, and we have some more freedom for shifts. But the structure is is, is very similar. Uh, so this proof for the reverse breast complete inequality it is based on the optimal transformation argument of Frank Bard, and uh, Bard Marson he used the heat equation argument. And so that the arguments are not the same, and most probably both arguments can be used for both uh, theorems. But at the moment, uh, yeah, yeah, we are just happy to have the we are just happy to have a proof for the for characterizing the 
extremize those. Finally, I just, um, so I, I, I guess I just skip the argument, this optimal transportation. So I just um, want to close a little lemma in our argument uh, that, uh, that might be useful in, in other circumstances. This is kind of a variant of Caffarelli's uh, contraction principle. So, you know, for Caffarelli's contraction principle, uh, you start with the central Gaussian uh, density and you consider an other log concave density that is uh, more log concave than the Gaussian density. Now here, uh, we have much weaker condition. You can consider um, any probability density F and all we need is that this um, probability density is sub-Gaussian. So that, that is some constant so that our F is at most uh, um, some constant C such that the, or, or um, kind of general probability density F is at most C times uh, um, this uh, given Gaussian density. And in this case, uh, um, the Benier map, uh, it happens to be, it happens to have linear growth. So linear growth means that um, uh, the kind of the Tx is uh, bounded above by a constant of uh, x, norm, x norm is large. So th this is the context of this um, um, statement. For those who, who are not um, familiar with optimal transportation, here is the definition of the Benier map. So you just transport the, um, the measure determined by F uh, <coughs> uh, to the measure associated to, <coughs> so, so you, you transport the, the two measures so that the, uh, the many pushes forward the measure induced by G uh, to the measure associated to F. And um, so this is just optimal transportation and um, the many map has this uh, extra condition that the, uh, <coughs> then the uh, differential, uh, the gradient is, is positive definite. So, and, 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 and it's used in the argument. So it's not only uh, optimal transportation. In this case, the, uh, this Benier map has to have a linear growth. Okay, so probably this much I, I, I wanted to say, I think my time is up. So thank you very much for the attention and um, you know, have a nice day. And